Good morning. Oh my. I knew that would take Turn place. Your cell phones off. Yeah. Well, I'm I've got it on because uh, UPS is supposed to deliver some some books. I gave him my number and they're supposed to deliver right down there, but um, that that was not UPS. Unfortunately. I think I'm going to blast off at any moment with this headset on and uh, well, it is good to be back with you and I look forward to our time together that we can enjoy God's Word. Um, so much is taking place in the world around us. As a matter of fact, um, I hope you don't mind because after talking to several people yesterday, I'm probably going to switch my topics just a little bit. I'll call them whatever you want me to call them, but I do have a, a burden for several things that are taking place. Matter of fact, uh, maybe if you watch the news, you saw that there's quite an event taking place as the United Nations has called a very special session, uh, and they did it, I, I believe, on purpose because this is the eve of Passover in Israel, and they're, they're requiring Israel now to come to a United Nations meeting, and uh, it's a great, uh, it's, it's a disgrace for Israel to have to come and meet on Passover, let alone the eve of Passover, but it just shows you how the world just loves to, to uh, I can say, humiliate them and do anything they can to, to put Israel in a bad light. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about some of those things just a little later on. I mentioned to you that I have uh, UPS hopefully making a, a delivery sometime here in the next hour or so because there will be some additional books that I will have. I'm anxious for you to look at some of those. But on the table, which is the far one over here, uh, there's some um, jewelry from Israel. Uh, there's some lotion from Israel. And uh, there's also some uh, scars from Israel. They're, they're cashmere. And uh, so take a look at those. And of course, there's some books as well. Uh, many other things that I'd like to tell you about. But to be honest with you, what I'd really like to do is to try to cram one or two additional sessions into the four that I have. And so I don't want to take any more time for a commercial. But if you will, uh, what I'd like to do is to have you take your Bible and turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. We're going to be looking at the time of the end and uh, some indicators that we're at the end of time, the end of time in terms of this age of grace and this day of grace. And uh, I appreciate what our brother just spoke about that, that really one of the things that we need to do is to teach critical thinking. Matter of fact, there's a huge difference back home in, in the Sunrise Christian Academy. We have a number of international students and uh, what we find is there's a, a huge difference in how education occurs in the east and how it occurs in the west and in the east basically you're given a set of facts to to memorize and to to regurgitate as he mentioned but there's a a, a significant difference in the fact that our hope is that in education here we teach people how to think how to take information how to read it how to simulate that information and then come to a conclusion based on the evidence uh, the evidence in the information that you have and that's how come it's so important for us to be able to read and understand God's word? So where are we in terms of, of this time of the end? And I'd like to try to present the, the concept in this way. Look, if you will, at Daniel chapter 12 and beginning in verse 4 and then verse 9. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, notice the phrase there, there's the time reference, until the time of the end. It says this, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And then verse 9, and he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So what is this time of the end? How do we really know that we're on the brink of Jesus coming? Because I personally believe that Christ could come at any moment. I know it's somewhat controversial in some circles. I don't know if it is here or not. It doesn't really matter because I believe what I believe. But I'm one who believes that prior to the tribulation, Christ comes for the church. That he doesn't bring the bride through the tribulation, but instead he brings the bride into heaven. And we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But as I look around at the earth today, as I look around at current events today, I'm quite convinced that we're on the brink of Jesus Christ coming back. Here's why. Because the items that he mentions that will take place in the tribulation are just about to take place. And so as we see these items approaching us that the Bible says will take place in the tribulation, and if we don't go through the tribulation, we've got to be really near to when Christ comes back for the church. Matter of fact, 
sometimes people say, well, when do you think he's going to come? And so my guess is that he may come today. Here's why. He didn't come yesterday. I say he may come today. You know what? God has his own timing, his perfect timing. And I'm not trying to, to disrupt that. I'm not even trying to suggest to God when it should be. Because I know this, when he comes, it will be exactly right. But I think it's important for us to see that God rebuked those in his generation because they did not know the scriptures and they weren't aware of the plan of God. And I think it would be the same reprimand that he would give today. And so when we come to Daniel chapter 12, remember after the incredible things that have happened in the book of Daniel, all of them indicating, I'm going to say, world powers. The Gentile world powers in particular in chapter 2 with the dream and the image of Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to look at that in just a few minutes to a certain degree. But he said, Daniel, shut up the word, seal the book. Now, so much of the Bible, matter of fact, in Revelation, remember, the seal is broken. And the events that take place in the book are opened up. But to Daniel, now we're looking about 2,600 years ago. To Daniel, he says, shut up the book, seal the words until the time of the end. How do you know the time of the end? And he tells how that will be. Look at the two clues. Number one, he says this, many shall run to and fro. Next, knowledge shall be increased. Is there an increase in travel today? It's unbelievable, isn't it? Matter of fact, someone told me the other day, they said, we drive by the school three or four times and you've never been there. I said, you know, if you don't call and make sure that I'm going to be there on that particular day, there's an excellent chance I'm not going to be there because I'm either on Delta or I'm on Delta.com. I mean, that's, that's just how life goes. I went to the airport the other day and uh, they were going to charge me for my luggage. I said, you've got to be kidding and the little girl said, no, it's $25. I said, you know what? I'm not going to pay $25. I've never paid $25. I'm not going to pay that for that back. She says, well, then you're going to have to use your Delta miles. I said, check them. I had a little over a million. I said, maybe I could ship that bag free. I have to call the supervisor. Yeah, the supervisor came, looked at it, and she says, Dr. Lindstead, your bag will be free. I said, thank you. Hey, this is ridiculous. Do you understand how we live on planes today? Do you understand how we, how we crisscross back and forth across the cities in our cars? Do you remember that, that it wasn't even a, a generation ago that, that driving 100 miles, 400 miles, 500 miles was, was incredible? And today we go thousands of miles and, and it doesn't affect us. Recently I, I went to China. I was there eight cities in 10 days. I came home for three days and I went back again for two more days. No big deal. You sit on a plane. You get to read. You, you do your correspondence. Hey, here's what he said. Here's how you'll know when the end is coming, travel will increase. One of my favorite people ever in history is a man by the name of Voltaire. Have you heard of Voltaire? And the reason I like him, he's an atheist, and he was so outspoken against Christianity. It's okay to have a favorite atheist, isn't it? And the reason I like him, he's my favorite atheist, he's so easy to pick on. Voltaire is the one that picked on Christianity in a variety of ways. Matter of fact, he said this. He said, do you know that the Bible is so out of date that he says, someday you won't even be able to find a copy of the Bible. Now, let me tell you that the Bible still remains to be the number one bestseller in the world. And Voltaire's works, about 10 years ago, you could buy the entire compilation of Voltaire's works for $5. Yeah, Voltaire, take that. Matter of fact, his home, his home where he criticized Christians so much, the Bible Society bought it, and it's now the Bible Society's headquarters. Well, here's what Voltaire said. Because a man by the name of Sir Isaac Newton, have any of you heard of Sir Isaac Newton? Yeah, he's, he's called the father of engineering. The three basic laws of engineering that, that all science and all engineering is based on really came from, from Isaac Newton. 
And Isaac Newton was an outspoken Christian, and Isaac Newton said this. He said, I really believe, based on Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, that someday people will travel at rapid rates of speed. He said, I think someday they may travel at the rate of 20, 30, 40 miles an hour. And Voltaire said, you see what a fool Christianity has made of a brilliant mind like, like uh, Newton. He said, everyone knows if you traveled at 20, 30, 40 miles an hour, that your heart would stop and you'd suffocate. <laughs> oh boy. Wouldn't you like the Voltaire on the back of a motorcycle? <laughs> Just one time, pop a wheelie <laughs> and do about 70. Hey, you know what the Bible said? 2,600 years ago, the Bible said that when you see people traveling at incredible rates of speed, when you see people traveling all over the world, and it's just a, a regular routine, then you know we're approaching this, the time of the end. I think we're there. Do you understand how many thousands of planes take off every day? Do you understand how many, how many hundreds of trains and, and transportation vessels all around the world are, are just involved? Matter of fact, as I was getting ready to come up here, I have one son who's delivering a Learjet to Germany. I have another son who's in France recruiting. And I have a, an assistant who's in the Bahamas interviewing players to come. A and we all left about the same day. It's ridiculous. Next, knowledge shall increase. H has knowledge increased? Oh my goodness, it's incredible, isn't it? Matter of fact, what they're telling us is this, that the rate at which knowledge is increasing is that every two years, knowledge doubles. 90% of the medicines used right now were not developed 10 years ago. And so here's the encouraging thing. If we double knowledge every two years, it means this, that if you graduated from college two years ago, you're halfway out of date. That makes you feel good, doesn't it? Now, don't worry about that. And, and here's what I say, because the main thing really in school is to learn how to learn. So I'm not trying to put you down. I, I think any knowledge is pretty valuable. But here's what he said. When knowledge is going to increase, listen, we're at a, a time when it's increasing exponentially. I, I, re, I was almost hilarious because I was talking to some students back home and I was all excited about something called raspberry pie. How many of you know what raspberry pie? I'm not talking about the kind you eat. Oh. <laughs> Jake, he said, yeah, I'll take a piece of raspberry pie right now. Are you with me? A little computer? Yeah, it's a, it's a little computer about the size of my iPhone, and then you put other Lego parts to it, and it is just dynamite. I mean, really, we're, we're blasting stuff all over the United States. We can turn off lights. We can turn off air conditioning systems. We can cause all kinds of havoc, and you do it sitting in a classroom with a low-powered computer called Raspberry Pi. I've just given your kids some bad ideas. All right, now, but here's what I'm saying. This, this was unheard of five years ago. Now it's changing every curriculum in every engineering school. I say, okay, why are you messing with it? You want to know why? Because when, I, when my kids graduate from Sunrise, I want them to go out there and I want them to be able to understand every single technical thing going on. Because that tells them we're at the end. Can you imagine 2,600 years ago, Daniel was told, all right, seal the book. The things that God showed Daniel concerning future Gentile world powers, he said, seal it until the time of the end. How is it you know the end? When travel increases, when people are running to and fro, and when knowledge is increasing, then you know, I'm, I'm ready to come. I'm ready to set up my kingdom. We're there, folks. Daniel chapter 12, verse 9. He says, go that way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed, and it's, it's a done deal, until the time of the end. I want to try to introduce it in using this terminology. I think you've, you've probably heard it before, but I think it's, it's very true. It's what I'm going to call crunch time. Now, I've been asking, do you all listen to, do you all watch college basketball? And I, I found out you don't, you don't know what it is. I know in Canada, you guys throw that little puck on the ice. And I learned it in Winkler, and it's called, uh, is it called icing? No, what, what's that called? Who? No, 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 I know what hockey is. The little thing you hit it with a stick. And if, you, and if you can't find the little thing you hit with a stick, then you hit each other. And you aim for the teeth. 
curling, that's, yeah, curling, yeah. See, I thought you did that to your hair. But up here, y'all, y'all get, the, get this, it, it looks like a big puck, huge. Matter of fact, I thought it was a chunk of cheese at first, and I could understand why people were chasing it. But they said no. And then they squeep. And so I had the idea, wow, if they squeep like that, when I throw the cheese on the floor, if I could throw the cheese on the floor at school, I'd have people squeeping up, I'd have the cleanest school in the world, all chasing this big hunk of cheese. But I mean, they get down on their belly, they look at it, they, first of all, you got to sight it from several different directions, you know, and uh, then you hurl this thing down there. Wow, it, I, it's got to be exciting because everybody's watching it, you know. I'm thinking, wow, you know, pretty soon this thing's going to go over the cliff, it's going to take off, and I'm going to get excited, but no, it just lands on a bullseye. And then the next guy, he takes all the fun out, he knocks the thing off the bullseye. And I thought, good grief, that's nasty. Knocking the thing off the bullseye when the guy crawled on his belly, swept the whole way down. I don't know. Now, how did they get it? Oh, crunch time, yeah. Well, I'm going to introduce a new sport to you. It's called basketball. And what we say is that when you get to the last couple minutes, you can watch a whole pro game. It doesn't matter. The score doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Because the only thing that matters is the last two minutes. You know what I'm saying? Hey, in, uh, in cheese derby, or whatever that's called, I guess it is crunch time too because... They, they hurl four, five, six pucks down there. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the last one or two. Crunch time. You see, we're at crunch time. My, my point is this. The intensity picks up as you get close to the end. Are you with me? You see, you see my point? I, I made a horrible point. I'm sorry. I don't need to make fun of cheesing. Uh, cheesing's good. And I, it'll probably be Olympic. It is an Olympic event, isn't it? Yeah, we eat hamburgers at home, and I like cheeseburgers, so I think I'd like this sport, and I think I'd be good at it, but I just don't know all the rules. Crunch time. We're at crunch time. And as you get down to the final couple minutes of a game, and when you get down to the, the final couple, couple chunks of cheese, this is what really counts. The rest of it was just for fun. And you see, we're at crunch time in human's history. One person said, yeah, it, it just looks like everything's falling apart. No, it's not falling apart, folks. Look around the world. It's not, I'll guarantee you, it's not falling apart. It's falling into place. It's exactly what the Bible said would take place. It's exactly what God said would take place. It's exactly what the word, the eternal word of God said place. And so that's why I'm so excited because he told Daniel to shut up the book, seal it until the time of the end. But listen, folks, we're at the end. And as a result of that, this Bible, this Word of God is opened up, wide open. And you cannot watch world events without saying, wow, the Bible is being fulfilled, being fulfilled exactly as God said it would do in the last days. I think we're living in that wonderful time. So here's what I'm telling you. Why not be excited about the fact that what God predicted in his Word is coming true exactly today? And so we want to look at some of those things concerning that. Well, what are some of the indicators? And I'm going to go through some of them quite quickly today. And then as I mentioned to you, I think what I'm going to do is, is maybe take my afternoon session and talk to you a little bit about the rise of Islam. Because you know what I find? I find almost everywhere I go, people are concerned about Islam. Will Islam take over the world? And, and what is the role of Islam in the last days? And what does the Bible say about, well, you know, the Bible is very explicit about what will take place in terms of Islam. And so let's take a look at some of these things. What are some of the indicators well, the indicators, there's about 12, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to number them all with you, but here we go. One of those has to do with, with this idea that the Bible indicates, Daniel chapter 2, the Bible indicates that in the final days, there's going to be 10 regions. Now, this is, to me, it's pretty interesting. Let me flip back to uh, a, a little site, because this is the actual vision of Nebuchadnezzar. And remember, Nebuchadnezzar saw a, a golden image. And it began with gold at the head, and then the chest and arms of silver, and the belly and the thighs of bronze, and the legs of iron. And then he got down to the, to the feet, and they were part of iron and part of clay. Now, what was the significance of that? Well, we're not going to take the time today to go through the whole thing, other than to say the Bible identifies each of those regions. And we know that historically, all those things came true, and we also know, because of some indicators in Revelation chapter 19, that the iron legs were the Roman Empire. And so the Bible said that in the days when you see ten divisions come out of the iron legs, 
and it will be part clay, part iron. In other words, something of Rome is now extended to this final kingdom. But other things have been mixed in so that there's ten kings. And, and while they're mixed together, they don't appear to one another because of how clay and iron mingle. But what is interesting is that actually the world has been divided into ten divisions. The United Nations made quite a process of this. And they took the world, and I've showed you by color scheme how they're divided. Now, I don't think the United Nations was trying to fulfill the word of God, do you? But isn't it interesting that here's the United Nations, and by the way, you're going to probably going to think that I don't agree very often with the United Nations, and if you come to that conclusion, you're exactly right. Because they usually try to do something opposite to the word of God. But isn't it amazing that by doing that 10 nation or that, that federation of 10 regions is exactly what the Bible said would be in the last days. And the Bible clearly says that when you see this 10 region federation, that out of those toes will come an antichrist. And the antichrist will rule for a short time and will give all of his power to Satan. And folks, we're now at a time when we've divided the world into 10 regions. And so I think that's a, a great indicator of the time frame that we're in. What are some of the other indicators? Go with me, to, if you will, to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. There's so much more we can say about those 10 regions, but my point today is to introduce you to some of these indicators, and we'll have to spend some time maybe at another conference developing more of how that came to pass. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord. The burden means it's a heavy load. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel. Thus saith the Lord, who stretched forth the heavens, laid the foundation of the earth, and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about, when there shall be in the siege against it, Judah and against Jerusalem. In that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. It's really the word lifting stone. For all people, notice how inclusive it is. It says that all nations, all people will come against Jerusalem. All that burden themselves with it should be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth should be gathered together against it. The Bible is very clear that among the things that will take place in the last days is that all the world will be against Israel. Is that true? It's really unbelievable. And before we're done, I'm going to show you news articles, news clips that will show you that even in our country, President Obama recently blamed Israel for their terrorist activity. It's, it's just, how can you look at the news and how can you come away with that conclusion? And so here's, here are some, some posters that have come in the news. But notice this, that they say that Israel is the cancer that must be removed. Hate America, crush Israel. And time and time it goes on. Or how about this one? Israel in Jerusalem. As you know, there's quite a controversy. Because you see, Israel maintains that Jerusalem is its capital. And it's interesting because almost no nation accepts Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, now what if I came up and said, you know what? I'm not going to honor Ottawa as the capital of Canada. Instead, I'm going to make it uh, Calgary. What would you say to me? You'd say, you know what, you're crazy. Because as an American, you don't have a say and you don't get a vote in the whole process. If we say it's Ottawa, it's Ottawa. Isn't that what you'd say? Are you with me? I got you right in the middle of your nap and I'm sorry. All right, but, but, but you see, it, wouldn't that be ridiculous? So here comes the world and they say to Israel, hey, you cannot have Jerusalem as your capital. What business is it of the world where Israel says the capital is? Now, why, why do they want to say Jerusalem is not the capital? Oh, there's a reason. The reason is because the United Nations is trying to say that Jerusalem does not belong to Israel. They're trying to say it's Palestinian. Now, I know I'm not going to be politically correct during this conference. I hope I'm going to be biblically correct, but I know I'm not going to be politically correct. 
But do you understand that the movement today that's going to call Israel out of the Passover to go meet with the United Nations, it all has to do with humiliating Israel and trying to establish to the world that really Jerusalem belongs to the Palestinians. And so the United Nations, and unfortunately the United States, is now going along with this whole idea that really Israel cannot choose her own capital. How ridiculous is it? But at the same time, it proves the point because it says this. The Bible said that in the last days, all the nations will come against Israel, against Jerusalem, and that's exactly what is taking place at this very moment. Hey, remember what he said to Daniel? Shut up the words. Seal the book. And in the end, I'm going to open up the book. I'm going to make it so that every time you turn a page, every time you open a, a, a page of the Bible, you're going to find, hey, I'm getting ready to come and establish my kingdom. Listen, folks, before he ever comes to establish his kingdom in the millennial reign, there's going to be something called the Battle of Armageddon. Before Armageddon can ever begin, there's going to be seven years of tribulation. And in the middle of that tribulation, the Bible says the Antichrist will make an appearance and that the people of the world will come and they will worship him. I'm hoping to do one whole session on an open door for the Antichrist. I cannot believe how open the door is for an Antichrist to come at this very hour. We're welcoming men. But let me tell you this. The Antichrist cannot make his power known until the church is gone. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Greater is he that is in you, the Spirit of God, than he that is in the world. There's something that restrains him and makes it so that he cannot come. And I think the Bible says that he'll come to set up his kingdom and not before Armageddon. He'll come and he'll set up his kingdom and Armageddon will come, but not before the tribulation. In the tribulation, in the midpoint, the Bible promises that the Antichrist will be revealed clearly and he'll set up a, a kingdom... In order to be part of that kingdom, you're going to have to take his mark, his number. Somehow, on your body, somehow in your body, there will be a mark that will allow you to buy, sell, trade, allow you to function. A little later today, in this morning session, I'm going to try to, to get to a couple things that might show you how near we are to that. And before he can ever begin his seven-year period, there's got to be a treaty a treaty that's not working and it's going to take a mastermind, an antichrist to come and get the leaders of the world, including the Jews, Daniel 9, 27, to say, hey, we need help to make this work. Do you understand that right now there's three treaties on the books and none of them are working? Three. And what they need is a mastermind. I'm going to show you the invitation to come and make this work. They're looking for a political genius to do it. Let me tell you, that genius will come. He'll be inspired by Satan himself. And before that genius can ever come and bring about that, that seven years of peace promised in the Bible over and over again, before that can ever occur, you want to know something? Jesus is going to come in the clouds. He's going to go shout. And those who know Christ as Savior, they're going to be gone. And so here is Danny said, all right, shut up the words. But when crunch time comes, when, you see, it used to be that every hundred years or every several hundred years, something would happen and you'd say, wow, that's a fulfillment of the Bible. Folks, do you understand that almost every day, almost every week, we're seeing incredible things happen that say the Bible is in tune with what's going on. How can the Bible be up to date and still be three or four thousand years? How can that happen? It's a living word given to us by a living God. Folks, you never have to apologize for that. Matter of fact, you want to know something? You don't even have to defend the word of God. God will defend his own word. But I'll tell you what, it's really good to be on the side of the Bible because the Bible is going to prove to be exactly right. Go, if you will, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. I listed that reference on here. And it's so interesting, and I don't know, I'm not going to take a lot of your time today because I've turned over a whole new leaf and I promise I'm not going to end one minute late, Ted. I know you're sitting up there, and I see the shotgun you've got in your hand. And uh, he told me if I go over one second, no, he didn't tell me that. He was going to shoot me. And so um, that's why I'm wearing a bulletproof vest. <laughs> Luke chapter 21, verse 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, notice that plural, 
that know that its desolation is near. May I just suggest to you that at the first coming of Jesus, when many people think, well, maybe this was completely fulfilled, there was only one army that surrounded Jerusalem. It was the Roman army. Now look at your Bible, because doesn't your Bible say plural? And you want to know something? That has not occurred yet, but it will. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 say this, that all the armies of the world will gather against Israel. Folks, we're watching that take place. It used to be that there were a dozen or so nations that would stand firm with Israel. You've lost Mr. Harper. I don't know that Canada is going to stand anymore with Israel. We've watched President Obama. He doesn't stand with Israel, although he continually says, never has an administration supported Israel more than I have. Huh. I, I put a little picture here. I mean, can you imagine the insult when Mr. Netanyahu came to America spent a day and a half sitting in the White House lobby waiting to meet with the president and the president was at his daughter's birthday party and then went to make a night appearance on one of the, the late night shows and left the Prime Minister of Israel sitting there waiting to talk to him. You know what that's called? That's called the rudest insult you could ever do. And so we're watching the whole thing turn. I, I hope to show you maybe as many as 10 or 12 different news articles all within the last year or so. I'm going to show you how the world is turning. And yet at the same time, we always say, well, yeah, we're, you know, we're all for it. No. Listen, even churches are now saying the Palestinians have the right to Jerusalem. Folks, if we had time, I'd like to show you that the Bible is very clear. God says, I have chosen Jerusalem to establish my name. It is my city. And we, we can't give it away to whoever we please. It belongs to God. And, and when the Palestinians say, no, you know, we, we've been. No. Folks, who are the Palestinians? Matter of fact, answer this question. It's going to be important in just a few minutes. The Palestinians, do they have a land? Do they really even have a government? This is incredible. Because the United Nations is getting ready to establish Palestine and recognize Palestine. They have no government. They have no land. Never in the history of the United Nations has any recognition of a, of a country or a people been recognized without a government or a land. Why? The whole thing is to punish Israel. You know what the Bible said? Here's how you're going to know. You're going to see travel increase. You're going to see knowledge increase. You're going to see Israel, the whole world, looking at Jerusalem saying, wow, we're going to gather against Jerusalem and there's going to be a hatred of Israel. Are we watching those things take place? A cup of trembling. That cup of trembling described in Zechariah chapter 2 is this idea that whoever would pick it up, whoever would come, they'll be shaken. There's going to be so much concern there. Some of you may know that at our school, we do a yearly trip to Israel. I just finished trip number 68. And all the time, people tell me, well, is it really safe to go to Israel? I say, yeah, you know, you're right. You, you bring a good point. But I've got good news for you. This year, we're not going to stay the night in New York. And so we're going to be safe. We're going to be in Israel. Hey, folks, do you understand how many murders take place in New York every night? Or Chicago. Can you imagine living in Chicago? You know what I heard the other day? That they don't even list murder as a major crime in Chicago. Yeah, they said crime in Chicago is going down. A little asterisk on the, on the bar graph said not including murders. Oh my goodness. If murder's not a major crime, what is it? I mean, this is ridiculous. And so, yeah, it makes the news. And believe me, I'm concerned about security in Israel. But wow, we, we have cities all over the world where people are being murdered by the dozens every night. But the Bible says there's going to be a time when it's going to be a cup of trembling. People are going to shake for fear. It's going to be a burdensome stone. It says a stone that gives a hernia to, to lift it brings about a, a catastrophe. I think we're at that place. Now, Israelis killed in Jerusalem by a bus stabbing and a car ramming. Yeah, it occurred. 
a matter of fact, you probably know that uh, two buses ju just were blown up and, uh, and all those things. But here's what's interesting. Isn't it incredible? When was the last time you heard of an Israeli blowing up a Palestinian bus? When was the last time you ever heard of an Israeli strap on a suicide pack and go into to an Arabic school and blow the Arabic school up? When was the last time you heard of, a, of an Israeli stabbing a, a, an Arab? It, isn't that incredible? And yet the world blames the violence in the Middle East on Israel. Find one teaching in all of Judaism that condones the idea that you're to, to murder or to stab someone who opposes you in a, in a religious belief. Now, if you were to go to Israel, and if you were to hear me to, to talk with my guide and to some of my other Israeli friends, you would think you were having the biggest argument in the world. And when we're done, we stand up after all of our shouting, and we either shake hands or hug each other, and we each go our own way. And the next day, we come back and we eat again. That's how you argue. I mean, that's how you discuss in Israel. But you see, even though I disagree with what they may say in terms of a Messiah, they don't threaten to kill me and I don't threaten to kill them. Do you see the difference? Because what does Islam do? Matter of fact, I'm going to show you a little later. And your current prime minister is, is actually very involved in this whole idea because the very mosque that he went and prayed is the very mosque that defines what an infidel is and by their own admission, they say it's anyone who believes in Judaism, who believes in Christianity, or has any other religious path other than Islam is an infidel and needs to be exterminated. So, so there's a very fundamental difference in this whole thing. And we're watching this take place. Or how about this? Israel says it will not accept international presence in East Jerusalem. So, so this is incredible. The United Nations, matter of fact, there's four people that all say we could bring peace to Jerusalem. One of those is the United Nations. And the United Nations says, you know what? If you will let us take care of Jerusalem, we'll bring peace. And Israel says, no, we're not going to do that. Okay? Recently, the Pope... And the Vatican said, give Jerusalem to us, to the Catholic Church, and we will bring about peace. Hmm. Wow, uh, it's unbelievable. Now, I don't know how to illustrate that other than to say, it would be like having a fox, hire a fox to take care of the chickens at night in the chicken coop. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous. And so, it, here they are. Unbelievably, Israel has allowed that golden dome to be there. Now, I don't mind telling you that even though I support Israel, I disagree with some of the decisions that they make. And one of those decisions was this. In 1967, when Israel's army took over Jerusalem and they took over the Temple Mount, they allowed them to continue the practice of Islam on the Temple Mount. I think it was a mistake. Because I really believe that that golden dome right there is, is a detriment to the whole society in that area. Matter of fact, recently they made it so that when you go up to visit the Temple Mount, and by the way, when you say Temple Mount, that assumes there was a temple there at one time. Are you with me? Now the Palestinians say there's no evidence of a temple ever in the history of the Temple Mount. Okay. Folks, if you believe that, then you've got you to eliminate a lot of the Bible. Because the Bible talks about it. It's called Mount Moriah. It's where Abraham offered up Isaac. I'd say that's Jewish, would you? It's where Solomon built a temple. I'd say that's Jewish, wouldn't you? It's where Ornan's threshing floor was. And David, I'd say that's Jewish, wouldn't you? It's where every temple and every great sacrifice is made on the Temple Mount. And so, isn't it amazing that Islam would say, that's where we want to establish this golden dome. Now, it's not a mosque. On the Temple Mount, on the south end, there is a mosque called the Mosque of Omar. And the Mosque of Omar is actually the second holiest place to Islam. The first holiest place is a place called Mecca. Are you with me? 
Okay? The second holiest place is the moss that's up there. And the reason why they say it's the second holiest place is because Muhammad had a dream. And in the dream, he dreamed that he was as far from Jerusalem, uh, as far from Mecca as he could possibly be. And so in his Bible, in the Quran, it calls it the far place. Doesn't name it Jerusalem, just calls it the far place. And Muhammad said, well, what could be further from Mecca than Jerusalem? Now, whatever you think of Muhammad, he wasn't good at geography. Because that's not the furthest place from Mecca. And so he said, that's got to be the place that was in my dream. How did this become the third? Well, if you think that story's crazy about the second one, wait till you hear this one. Are you ready? Muhammad died. It's always sad when a religion's got a dead leader. You know, I, I was in one of, the, one of the Buddhist temples. And the guy said, you want to see a hair of Buddha? I said, not really. He says, yeah, but, you know, this is Buddha's hair. We think it came from his beard. I said, wow. I said, you know, here's why I'm not really interested. Because if you're worshiping a dead God, he's not much of a God. My God's alive. And I said, so I'm really not into dead Buddha hair. Well, Muhammad died. Dead on the horse. The horse went right where that dome is. From that rock, he jumped to heaven. Don't be impressed with Muhammad. He's dead. He, did, he was UPS delivered to heaven on the back of a horse, and he was dead. He's still dead. Can you believe they, they, they worship him? Now, I'm impressed with the horse. You get a horse that can jump from earth to heaven... You got a jumper, all right? Matter of fact, he jumped so hard, they say there's a hoof print in the rock. I've seen the hoof print. It's a big horse. Because, no, I'm not kidding. The hoof print's almost, it's over 16 inches around. That's a big horse. You know what that's called? It's called a lie. Okay? But that gives them a claim to that. And so, so here they are, and they say, all right, as a result of that, really, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem particularly, belongs to the Arabs. When Israel took back the Temple Mount on the Six-Day War, they allowed Islam to continue the worship there. I wish they would have stopped it. And in the last two years, we can no longer even bring a Bible up on the Temple Mount. You want to know why? Because the Arabs who patrol the area as you come in, as you go up, it's not, a, it's not an Israeli police force because in a, Israeli police force will let you carry a Bible up there. But an Islamic police force goes through your bag, and if you have a Bible, you either have to leave your Bible there or you can't go on the Temple Mount. You know what? They're so backwards, they don't know that all of us have iPhones and we got the Bible on our iPhone, so we go up there and we read from our iPhone, it's okay. Yeah. Don't tell them that. So... Here they are. Israel saying, no, we're not going to have that presence in East Jerusalem. We're not going to be a divided city. Folks, that's exactly what the conflict in Zechariah is all about, is dividing the city. We're living in the last days because these are the headlines. And then the Temple Mount clashes, and it continued. King Jordan, uh, he warned Israel over Jerusalem's holy site violence. The holy site he's talking about, there it is, Alaska Mosque, the, the brown, oh, the gray dome one, and... Uh, he said, yeah, you, you guys are causing quite a ruckus there. Or how about this one? Uh, Palestinian stabs a policeman at, at the crosswalk. Okay, he pulls out a knife, he stabs it, and in the press of America, they said, shame on the policeman for invoking the stabbing. Why? He ignored the man who stabbed him. Yeah, the guy came up, stabbed him in the back. Hard. Uh, do you understand when, you're, when someone comes up and stabs you in the back, you probably are ignoring him. I mean, common sense has, has left us. Well, there we are. The Bible says all nations will be against Israel. Here's a sign, kill the Jews. Or how about this one from the Jerusalem Post? Palestinians invited hundreds of leaders to flag raising ceremony and the U.N., 
No land, no government, the United Nations now recognizes them. And because Israel has so many sanctions against them, they actually have more rights than the nation of Israel, the Palestinians, just now welcomed into the United Nations. Or this one, Obama accuses Israel of terrorism as more Jews are murdered. Think about that. The, the number of Jews being murdered is way more than the number of Palestinians that are injured. And our president says Israel is using excessive force in defending themselves. Let me just tell you this. I think that if a terrorist comes into your country, you have a right to use excessive force. If not, why are we taking our shoes off every time we board an airplane? Has anyone ever thought about it? Isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever seen in your life? One guy hides something in his shoe. And now we've got to have stinky feet in every airport in the world. I mean, really, it's, it's just stupid. But it gives a lot of people jobs, so I shouldn't be critical of it. Um, here's another thing. Do you understand that the Bible indicates that there's no America, either North America or the United States or Canada? You want to know something? I really think our countries are going to collapse. Here's why. I think when it comes down to it, I think that we're going to so be sucked in by the world system. Once the Christians are gone, common sense will be gone. And I think our countries will collapse. Frankly, you want to know something? I'm worried about what's going to take place in America in the next 72 hours. Here's why. Because I think America is indicting and initiating this whole process against Israel on the Passover. And I wouldn't blame God if he said, you know what, America, my, my grace has been extended to you long enough. And he just removes his hand. Because let me tell you, every single day there are people that would like to destroy people in America. And it's going to happen. And I'm afraid it's probably going to happen to Canada as well. You watch the economic collapse of our countries. Listen, folks, you want to know something? I believe we're so close to the coming of Christ. And it may sound sad to say America's going to collapse, Canada's going to collapse. But when we see Jesus and we're taken to heaven, and you see the, the evil that prevails against our country, and you see how our countries will turn against God, you know what you're going to say? You're going to say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking us out in just the nick of time. I think that's what we're going to say to God. Then Technology. There's, there's so much I like to do on this. And uh, let's see. And I, um, how much time do I have? 13 minutes. 13 minutes. Okay. Let's talk about technology. And, and I'm not going to try to do the, the whole thing on technology, but there's just a couple things that, that I'd like for us to, to look at. One of those is the fact that we looked at one Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. It's, it talked about travel and technology that it would increase. And you've got to admit, we've seen some pretty radical changes in terms of technology in the last decade, haven't we? And even the last couple of years and even more is going to come. But in Revelation chapter 13, go there if you will just for a moment. Because I know you're familiar with the passage and I know in other times when I've been with you several years ago, we, we looked at this in particular. We'll look at it again if we do our our session on the Antichrist. But I want you to, to notice something in chapter 13, verse 13. And he, this is the, the beast that comes up out of the earth. I think it's the false prophet. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of men. He deceives them. We're going to find out that's a key word. He deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast that had a wound by a sword, it did live. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, except that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six, or we call it 666, the mark of the beast. And what we're finding today is not only have we seen technology increase, not only have we seen travel increase, but we see the need for a mark of a beast. 
Do you understand, in terms of security, how great it would be if we just had a way to implant maybe something into the hands of a person or into their forehead? And, and I know that almost sounds like, wow, that's, that's crazy thinking. As some of you know, I'm a principal of a school, and do you know how many, I think I've had three people in the last five years try to sell me a security system because in America we've had so many school shootings. And so they try to sell you a security system. And that security system has to do with putting some kind of a, a badge or a chip in a badge so that you know where everybody is at all time. Now, I think it will come to that. I think we're about one school violence program away from requiring that. I was talking to some guys that are here at the conference this morning, and uh, one of the new things they're doing back in our school, everyone knows everybody. Now, now we have to wear a, a nameplate in case I forget who I am. I, I'm old and see now, but I can still remember my name. I've got to wear a badge that says my name. I think it's kind of stupid, but okay. But I can see where they're going to require every single person that enters a school to have some kind of an identification mark, and I think it could well be something buried under your skin. You want to know why? Because only if you had a badge or something buried under your skin, otherwise the door's locked and someone's got to open that door. Because that's how important security is. Banks are all for it. Matter of fact, credit cards are for it. The vice president of the major credit card holding company of the world said this, he thinks that in the nursery they had to embed a chip into the body of a child. So that from that point on, there's, there's no mistake. I was speaking in Southern California. It's the Silicon Valley. And as I was talking about this, I, I was talking about, you know, it's kind of goofy. And the guy says, no. He said, matter of fact, he said right here in this audience, there's two of us that are working on a project. And we've embedded chips into the hands of people. And it's so critical that stolen identifications going back and forth across the Mexican-California border that they actually know of people that have had their hands cut off to retrieve the chip out of their hand so that they can get people in and out of the country. Oh yeah, th this is coming. And so the, the Bible indicates that there will be the technology to do it because the Antichrist will require it. If the technology wasn't available, he couldn't require it. Are you with me? The fact that he's going to require it says the technology is there. And next, in Revelation chapter 11, we won't turn to it, but remember, when the two witnesses die, it says that all the world sees them. In other words, there's going to be news events that are going to be broadcast all around the world at, at an instant of time. Yesterday or the day before, Prince died. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And they were saying, you know, you all used to... Sign. I, I didn't know one single song... He had. I'm sorry to be so ignorant of the times. But now I've learned purple rain, or rain purple, or something purple. Uh, uh, Barney, or whatever. Anyway, uh, and, and here, th this guy dies, and within minutes, every news station has a broadcaster there covering simultaneous these events. What does it matter if a guy's standing there in front of the Prince compound? I mean, they could tell you about it in New York, couldn't they? Put up a picture. But somehow today, what we want, we want a person standing right there. And the Bible says that they will actually broadcast live from Jerusalem where the dead witnesses are lying in the street and people are going to see them dead. They're going to see them rise from the dead, resurrection, and they're going to see them raptured, ascend into heaven. Now, that's going to be fun to play back slow motion. And the Bible says the technology will be here to do that. It's available today. You see what I'm saying? We, when we talk about technology, several things come to mind. Barcodes. We've grown used to those. They tell us what. They tell us what people buy. We've got shopping cards. Why, why does a store give you a discount if you've got a shopping card? Here's why. Because it tells who is buying the product. Now we have something, Walmart's a big, a big one on this. Oh, I don't want to show you that one yet. Uh, the RFID chip, it tells you where the products are. And, and it's become a major marketing thing. Some stores, 
I'm not going to mention Walmart by name. Some stores, they, when you buy their socks, their underwear, they know what product you bought, they know who bought it, and they know when you wear it in and out of the store. Hey, do you understand? We're, we're in, a, a, in an age when, when people are tracking every single thing going on. Think of all the, the video cameras and all the security cameras. Wow, you see... The Bible said that when the Antichrist comes to power, he's going to monitor every individual. Why? Anyone who's opposed to a system has got to be eliminated. Folks, do you understand? The technology to do that is here today, and it wasn't here 10 years ago. We're exactly where the Bible said we'd be in the last days. Let's see if I can... I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I've got video sound. Oh my goodness, I don't. Um, well, you'll, you'll get the, the idea maybe. Sorry, I don't have video sound on that. See how good technology is? Oh yeah, Br bring me back to the beginning. Do you need my microphone to pick that up? Okay. Uh, what if I back it up? There we go, now. Yeah, punch him down here maybe in this corner or Check outlines. Who needs them? Have a nice day. This is the future of e-business. Yeah, that's a commercial. And what they're doing, they're telling you, hey, it's old-fashioned to take out your credit card. It's old-fashioned to, you just go through, help yourself, and everything you want, as you walk out the door, it rings it up, and it's, it's already put on your tab. We're there. That's exactly what John wrote about in Revelation. You cannot buy, sell, trade. You can't have a job. You can't go to school unless you got the mark of the beast. And, and we're on the brink of that. Oh, my goodness. I've got two minutes. Let's just see. We may have to save this one for another moment. Yeah, yeah let's do. Um, I, I promise me I'll get back to that. Look at this. Uh, it was a secret for a long time. We built a, a 1.5 million square foot spy center. Okay? The biggest number that we talk about, you'll see it there, it's a, it's a Yoda byte. It's 500 quintillion pages of text. Just, just the power to run this thing can run 33,000 homes. And it's all set up for spying just in America. It's incredible. You want to know why? Because we want to know where everyone is at every second of the time. That's why your cell, I mean, do you understand with your cell phone, they can locate you at any time. That's why sometimes it's so much fun to lose your cell phone. You know you're driving somebody crazy in the spy center. <laughs> and some of us are doing a good job, aren't we? Yeah, see, men have helped this situation out more than ladies. Ladies keep track of theirs, but we lose ours all the time. I love it. Because here, there, there, there's, hey, that's exactly what the Bible said. Okay? One more minute or am I done? I'm done. I'm not going to tell you that there's a decay of society. I'm not, about, I'm not even going to tell you that there's alignment of nations because I don't want Ted to shoot me. 
And, uh, but believe me, we're going to talk about these things, and I want to show you what the Bible says. So, God willing, if you didn't rapture us before this afternoon, we're going to finish this, and then I want to talk about the rise of Islam. What is taking place in Islam? Why is it a threat, and why does God promise he'll take care of it? Thanks for your attention. God bless you.